saying go live. Okay. All right. So we're going live. As it shows, going live. Uh, it says Zoom setting up your meeting for Facebook Live. And then I'll go out. All right. So now let's go to Zoom. There we are. Screen. Dun, 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 dun. Mora. Morning. Can you, can you hear me? Very soft. And I've got my volume up quite loud. Okay, Jades, bless you. More loud. How does it sound? I'm just going to check me out quickly. Okay, there, there, there. So it's there. It's there, there, and there. Okay, we could. One, two. One, two. How does it sound? One, two, one, two. Can you guys hear me? That's the, the music's better. Now try your voice. Uh, Good day, morning, everybody. Just while we're getting set up, if you're with us, uh, we've got two minutes before we start. We're just setting up our audio. It's good to have you on with us again. One, That's good. Two, three. Piano is good. Your voice just a wee, wee bit more. Your voice. You're gone. Good morning. I'm just waiting for Johan to come back on and he's going to just take us in a time of worship. But welcome, everybody. It's good to have you. I don't know why he disappeared. <laughs> he was there, but he disappeared. So um, trusting that you're all well. Yeah, God is with us. I think that's what John Weasley said uh, when Prophet Krubus and I visited um, his uh, temple, his church in London in England. And a big picture of him, you know, as he was... Uh, sickly and waiting to be taken into the cloud of witnesses and all the brethren were around him and his closing words were and summed up his whole life and he said and best of all brethren God is with us so he's with us he's always with us he's with us he's with you now and uh, he's with you in the lockdown he's with you in your job he's with you in your business um, he was given the name Emmanuel which means God is with us and uh, Johannes coming back on and uh, so he'll be here any second. Yeah, this technology is amazing. Is Johan there? Aha, there's my brother. I lost you for a while. That's good. Can you hear me now? Yeah, vocal just up a wee, wee, wee bit. Thank you, Johan, for joining One, us. Are we there? Beautiful. You can hear so me greetings, well. everybody. Welcome, Johan. Would you just lead us in 10, 10 15 minutes praise and worship? Uh, we are past Passover. It doesn't mean that Passover is over and done with. It doesn't mean that it's insignificant, but we need to move on. There was a great difference between the post-resurrection apostolic church of Jesus Christ than there was before the resurrection. And the resurrection of Jesus had such a powerful impact on their lives that they continued to witness, to preach to, to testify. The theme was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I like what John Lawrence said uh, all the way there from Australia, from the land down under. He said, on the cross, he uh, paid the price. But at the resurrection, you know, he brought, bought us our innocence, our Amen. state of forgiveness, our pardon. So, awesome. Thank you. Bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, 
up from the ashes your love has brought us out of the darkness and into the light lifting our sorrows bearing our burdens healing our hearts to our god we lift up one voice to our god we lift up one song to our god we lift up one voice singing hallelujah to our god we lift up one voice to our god we lift up one song to our god we lift up one
path that clung to me And I have come to know a love Stronger than the grave In my darkest hours Raise me up From death to light In the resurrection power And oh, your love is strong
the never drying fountain. You're the comforter and counselor. Oh, take complete control. You're the Come, Holy Spirit. You're here with your presence, yeah. And you fill us with your power. And you live inside of me. Just one more time, sing it out. Welcome, Lord. Oh, welcome, Holy Spirit. You're here with your presence, oh, and you fill us with your power, and you live inside of me, yeah. Wow, awesome. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, thank you very much. Bless you. And uh, we'll see you a bit later towards the end of the service. Oh, amen. God is good. Let me just fix this very quickly and uh, bless you. Awesome. Uh, Johan is going to be just doing something for a couple of minutes and then he's going to join us. But thank you. Oh, what beautiful days that we live in. And I titled this morning's message, Past Passover, and as I said in the interlude right at the beginning before Johan uh, took over with that beautiful worship is that um, it's not passed in the sense that it's insign insignificant. And uh, there's a sense in which, you know, those old hymns, I will cling to the old rugged cross. And there's a, a sense in which, you know, the Apostle Paul said, I resolved to know nothing while a monkey except Christ and him crucified, is that we hold on to the cross as a centrality of truth, but we also move on. We hold on to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we also move on whilst holding on to those as deep truths and that, that we must never sacrifice at any cost um, any of the, the true doctrines around the person of Jesus we don't let go of. And so moving past Passover, it's really interesting to read in the book of Acts that once we get past the Passover, and of course, even more so, past a Pentecost, but from the resurrection of Jesus, the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus, his death and burial and resurrection, and uh, all the way through his ascension, and then he's coming back in the person and power and presence of the Holy Spirit. There's a dynamic shift and change in the disciples, but also um, in the early church, and it's reflected in the early church. And the early apostolic church post-resurrection became a church of wonders, a church of worship, first of all, a church of wonders, a church of the word, and, uh, and of course, a church of um, great, strong fellowship together. And, uh, you know, they were bound together and, and became powerful witnesses for Jesus Christ. And the resurrection featured powerfully in the apostles' um, doctrine and teaching. They realized that they were witnesses of the resurrection and needed to preach um, the gospel in the light of the fact of his resurrection. And so moving on, and you know, the whole Passover weekend is the fulfillment of so many prophecies, types, shadows, feasts, and festivals, um, celebrations, etc. And um, so we would be now into the Feast of Weeks. And uh, the beginning of the Feast of Weeks, um, or the Feast of Harvest, is Shavuot. And, um, and basically, it started on the Day of First Fruits. Uh, where it was counted, and that was when they would bring the two loaves, um, celebrating the end of the wheat harvest, and then celebrating it with the two loaves, which were offered and waved before the Lord, symbol symbolizing, you know, the rest of the harvest to come. So much symbolism in that, you know, Jesus, the first fruits and the firstborn from among the dead, and the two loaves becoming one, and so, so much symbolism in it, too much to go into. And uh, there would be seven Sabbaths, so seven sevens, 49 
And then the feast uh, of harvest or the Shavuot was then celebrated on the 50th day. So it's also known as the period building up to Pentecost. So we in that period right now building up to Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, which will be in a couple of weeks time. And I'm looking forward to that as well. That's going to be really powerful. But uh, in far as the Jewish mind was concerned, that this was a period of preparation um, from, the, from the Passover, because this is when they left Egypt um, all the way through uh, to, the, to the final day of uh, the Feast of Harvest or Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks. Um, and on that 50th day, was the, the, they celebrate the day the Torah, the law was given uh, by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. And the amazing thing is, you know, that um, it's incredible that on the day that the law was given, when Moses came down, he found that Aaron, under the pressure of the people, had built a car. And uh, you know the story, but plague broke out and 3,000 people died. So on that day, the giving of the Torah. But you know, the beautiful thing is about it and symbolism is there and it's beautiful that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. And so one is the law, uh, the letter of the law that kills the, the law of the spirit of um, life in Christ Jesus is the day of Pentecost. The other one is the law of sin and death. And, and so we're in that period and it's so powerful. And then, of course, later would be the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. And that would be Sakot. But, but just that's the period that we're in. But, you know, those, those um, 40 days between his, his resurrection and then his ascension, Jesus was really busy providing, the Bible says, convincing proofs and evidences. And he was sharing and unfolding like he did with Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus, starting with the law and all the prophets and even the Psalms. He went through and began to explain the sufferings of Christ and that he must die and that he must rise again. It's really interesting that in Luke, uh, Luke's gospel records that, that the two disciples did not recognize Jesus. There was something either, you know, he, he, he hid himself or concealed himself in a, in, a, in a manner. Some theologians think it's because he was no longer Christ of the flesh, but the resurrected body of Christ. And uh, but yet other appearances, they re immediately recognized who he was, even in his post-resurrection body and post-resurrection form, they recognized Jesus. But somehow he hid himself from them. But so significant it was when he broke bread that their eyes were open and uh, they saw Jesus. And he was eating and drinking again because he was in the kingdom. Remember, before he was betrayed, he said, I will not partake of this until I'm in my kingdom. So now he was in his kingdom. But it's interesting, Christ in the communion, Martin Luther shared. And so communion should always be so special because of this appearance is that, is that when he broke the bread, when he, he um, unveiled, uh, unveiled that, or when he did that, transacted that, suddenly the eyes were opened and then he withdrew from them and disappeared. And they were saying things like, we're not our hearts burning with it within us. And so these post-resurrection appearances were so powerful. And I've already alluded to one, but it's beautiful when uh, the woman, when, when the woman went running the early first, early in the morning, the first day of the week to, uh, they prepared the spices to go and embalm the body of Jesus. When they got there early in the morning, he was missing, but then um, angels appeared, two men or two angels appeared. And they said, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Wow. Woo. Take that death and hell. Man, I tell you, it's so powerful. And of course, um, the, 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 the woman then had an appearance of Jesus, Mary Magdalene the first and some other woman. And they ran and began to tell the disciples. And so um, I just wanted to run through this with you a little bit because it's so significant that we see the resurrected Christ. The work is done. The price has been paid. The sacrifice has been made. He's given his life for our sins, but he is still interested. He didn't immediately ascend to heaven and dust his hands up and say, okay, well, the job is done. And, and we see the tender mercy of Jesus. We see the loving kindness of Jesus. We see the incredible compassion and the heart of God, even in the appearances, <clears throat> sorry, of Jesus appearing to different groups of people. And, and just the amazing thing, not only to establish a credible witness to the fact of his resurrection, but there were some amazing healing and restorations that were taking place 
in this period of 40 days. 40 is also a time of testing, but it's also 40 is a time of establishing a generation. And so it was important for Jesus because he was establishing his generation. Isaiah 53 says, who will speak of his generation? He was cut off. But now we are the generation of Jesus Christ. So very early in the morning on Resurrection Sunday, he would have appeared to Mary Magdalene. I'm just looking at on a because it's too much for me to remember. Mary Magdalene. And um, later that day, there would be the other Mary, Salome, Joanna, and, and at least one other woman. And then later on, uh, the incredible thing is he, uh, he appeared to Simon Peter. And I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5. And, um, you know, he appeared, first of all, to, to Cephas, to Simon Peter. And I, I'm going to just touch on that uh, a little while later. But then um, later in the day to Cleopas and his companion as they were walking along the road to Emmaus. And I did speak to you about that one. Later again, in the same day or, or early the next day, he, he appeared to the 11 disciples, minus Thomas, of course, because Thomas didn't believe. And then somewhere in the following next eight days, he appears to the, the 12, including Thomas. And there's a great, incredible dialogue. You know, it's me, I'm flesh and, and bone. Yeah, put your finger in the nail marks, put your hand in my side. And Thomas became no longer a doubter, but a believer. And later after that, he uh, appears to Peter and uh, the others, the seven of them that were fishing at the Sea of Tiberias. You know, Peter <laughs> had gone fishing. I think Peter was in a really bad state. And then later on, um, you know, in the next few weeks, he appears to the disciples again and then to a large gathering of people possibly on the, on, on the Mount, um, in, on a mountain in Galilee. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, about 500 brethren, that he appeared to. That's besides Sistrin, of course, the ladies, and but 500 brethren. And then later on, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, he appeared to James and then the other apostles. And then somewhere towards the end um, of the 40th day, he uh, appears to the disciples again before he leads them out to the Mount of Olives, where he gives them the great commission, and then he ascends um, to resume his position at the right hand of the Father, where he ever lives to intercede for us. And I have a, a revelation on this. I think it's a revelation. But Hebrews tells us that he sat down once he had provided purification for sin. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty, became heir of all things. I think he sat there for a while, but immediately he then stood up. Because when Stephen was stoned, he said, I see the Lord standing at the right hand of the majesty and even ready to receive his spirit. And the reason why he was standing, because he was standing as high priest and there he ever lives to intercede for us. So it was the end of his earthly, but the resumption of his heavenly ministry. Well, I'm, I'm going on to the, the ascension day thing already, but you know, he ever lives to intercede for us. So there's an amazing thing that happened um, in these appearances. And I want to just try and make it personal to you and I. We're in lockdown, we're in isolation. You know, people are <laughs> saying a lot of stuff about the world's never going to be the same again. And I'm sure there's going to be some changes, but I think it's going to be very much the same. It's not going to end because Paul says in Ephesians 3, 3 uh, 2021, he says, world without end. So this world is not going to end. And so <clears throat> the two appearances that really bless me is the one with Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus and how Jesus elicits that whole conversation for him. But meanwhile, his persona is slightly hidden. And, uh, you know, there's, we guess at that. And, and however, I, I think he wanted them to recognize him not no longer as the physical Jesus, but as the spiritual Jesus. So we no longer relate to him as Christ after the flesh, but Christ born again, born, risen in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think those are the things that we need to uh, be cognizant of because the disciples had to move and adjust in their relationship with a physical, you know, um, Jesus who was limited in, in where he could be at any given time. And they need, need, needed to move their focus off him as the son of man to the Lord of glory. And, and so they were to... Um, now begin to relate him the way that we have to relate him, that we haven't seen him, but yet we're fooled with the joy of our salvation. We haven't seen him in the flesh. 
you know, John said, you know, that which, you know, concerning the word of life, that which we've seen, that which we've touched, that which we've handled, this we declare to you. And he declared that as a witness, but we haven't, uh, didn't have the privilege of handling the physical Jesus. But I tell you, more powerfully, because he went away and sent the spirit, now he's with us and in us all. Now he is the Lord of glory, omnipresent. He can be equally present with me, John Wasserman here in South Africa, and John Lawrence and Kathy Lawrence all the way down there in, in Australia. And, uh, you know, Dave and Carol Robertson English. So he's with every one of us, equally present all the time, everywhere. And so their faith had to begin to shift. And that's why uh, Jesus, uh, Paul says that in, in 2 Corinthians 5, that we know no man after the flesh. We once knew Christ that way, but we do so no longer. And of course, Paul didn't know Jesus after the flesh. Paul knew him after the spirit, the power of his resurrection. And so... Um, that appearance was brilliant. But then, of course, the other appearance, when the, the disciples were fishing, there were seven of them. I don't know what happened to the other five, but they were fishing. And uh, Jesus appears on the, on the shore, and then he says, well, have you caught anything? No, throw your net over to the other side. You know the story. And it was only later, and I think it was John first that said, you know, it's the Lord. And uh, Jesus had a miraculous catch of his own because he had prepared fish for them and a, a fish breakfast for them. And you know, the disciples then had caught such a, at his word, had caught such a big catch of fish that it was difficult for them to bring it in. And the amazing thing was that, again, they didn't recognize Jesus. But, you know, my theory is starting to relate to him as Christ after the Spirit. But here, this appearance was so, for me, so powerful. And that's why when Paul says he appeared, first of all, to Peter. You know that the last thing before Jesus died was that look at Peter after Peter had denied him the third time. And, and the, the dawning of that, the realization of that, where Peter had to swallow his own oaths and his words about, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And, uh, and the disappointment, the disillusionment. I mean, you talk about being down in the dumps, having denied Jesus just before he died, the last thing before his death was Peter's denial. And uh, man, I can't imagine how heavy hearted and how self condemnatory he would have been at that point in time. And then here comes Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. And possibly after the woman, the first person he goes to, he goes looking for Peter and he appears to Peter. I wonder what that meeting was like. I wonder what kind of emotion came out of Peter's heart what kind of sorrow, what kind of repentance. But, you know, this, this appearance of Jesus on the beach of the Sea of Tiberias was equally important because three times, once to cancel out each of his denials, he said, do you love me? And Peter's affirmation, increasing response, you know, Lord, you know I love you, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And the complete reinstatement of Peter and in the whole process almost He's appointed as the pastor of the church, you know, go and lead, go and feed my lambs, go and feed my sheep. The, the beautiful thing about all of this is that, is that reinstatement, is that cancellation, that heart of God, that heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the post-resurrection Jesus is not more disconnected than the physical pre-crucified resurrected Jesus, how with compassion and love he went about healing the sick and preaching the gospel and touching precious lives. You know, here he was doing the same thing again post-resurrection. So he was conscious of the fact that after he was raised, I need to get to see Peter. What a shepherd, what a savior, what a high priest that he would go. You know, remember he, he had prayed for Peter when he said, and it wasn't only Peter, incidentally, it was all of the disciples when he said, Satan has requested to sift you, the you there is in plural, you all as wheat. And they were all sifted. Judas was sifted and ended up committing suicide. And all the disciples, including John, even John ran away. And, um, you know, that, that Satan had sifted them all. And of course, Peter had denied Jesus and he really, really had struggled. But wow, you know, this reinstatement of Peter was so amazing. But the second one wasn't so much a reinstatement. It was an instatement. Wow. I tell you, I was so blessed. Man, 
This one is going to shock and amaze you. And maybe you've not heard this before. Maybe you have, but you know, I mean, you know, I've kind of dabbled into it, but this one really, really, really blessed me. You know that Jesus had brothers and sisters, siblings. And so they would have been kind of half brothers, you know, because uh, Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus. God was, you know, and Mary was his mother. But after the birth of Jesus, um, Mary went on to have other children with Joseph um, as their father. And so they were his brothers and sisters. They, they were referred to that, but, you know, more like half brothers and sisters, but they would have been regarded as brothers and sisters. So the one of them's name was Simon, the other Joseph, uh, the other Judas or Jude, um, as well as, and the oldest brother was James. And uh, Judas or Jude was actually the author of the book of Jude, and he had two sisters. And uh, the, the interesting thing was, there was one time when they came, his mother and his family, possibly his brothers, maybe including his sisters. And it tells us that in Matthew chapter 12, they came to where Jesus was preaching and Jesus was inside a house. And he was told that his mother and his brothers, his family were waiting for him outside. And you know, the interesting thing is not in an uncaring way, but Jesus didn't go out to them. He didn't run to their beck and call. You know, my um, question is, why were they not in the house? You know, if my brother was Jesus, I'd be hanging, <laughs> I'd be hanging around him. But, but you know, whatever, you know, there's, there's different dynamics in families. And so Jesus came up with that famous statement that included you and me. Thank God for that. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. And that implies that his mothers and his brothers and his sisters were all waiting outside for him. You know, some theologians um, think that, and, and with good reason, that, that they had come to get Jesus, thinking maybe he's going over the top, maybe he's a bit, you know, um, off his mind. You know, you know, maybe he's got a savior complex, of, you know, personality complex or something like it. But to come and to take possession of him and say, come on, son, come home. And so you know, really interesting. But from there, this whole unfolding thing, James, the eldest brother, the brother of Jesus, who incidentally wrote the book of James, um, was it seemed like he was a skeptic, seemed like he did not believe that his half brother, that his brother, older brother, truly was the son of God, you know, and, uh, you know, he, he didn't seem to believe it, but it might have been that not everybody in the family had the same understanding that Mary had. Remember, it said often about Mary, she hid these things, she treasured these things in her heart, but they may well have been, you know, aware of the fact that, you know, his miraculous birth and all these prophetic words, maybe there was some resentment, maybe, you know, there was a little bit of you know, teasing, oh, so you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God, um, you, you know and understand the family dynamic. But of course, also remember that um, there had been 400 years of silence, no prophetic word, no prophets, uh, there was silence, God had been silent. And so, you know, like in the days of Samuel, the lamp of God had almost gone out and the word of the Lord was rare. And so this could have been pretty unbelievable stuff. Remember also that they were a strictly orthodox Jewish family. And um, they might have been awaiting Jesus coming with the same mentality as all the Jews, a general, an army to lead them out of the oppression of Rome. So what happened? If, if James was like this, what, what happened? See, the day came when it was time for the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, it's interesting. I think it's in John chapter 7. I think it is where his brothers actually said to him, come on, why aren't you going up to the festival? You, I'm putting it a little bit in my own words, but you can find it there. You, know, you want to be famous. Why don't you go and show yourself? Go and do some miracles. And it seemed to me that there was a, a little bit of sarcasm in it. And you can find that in John chapter seven, verse five, if you're the son of God, it seems like there was a little bit of doubt concerning that. But anyway, the day of the crucifixion comes in on one of the utterances of Jesus on the cross is when he looks down at Mary, his mother, standing there and said, behold, your son, indicating John, the beloved disciple, and then to John, your mother, giving the responsibility and the care um, in his stead as the older brother, Jesus being the older brother, to John, the disciple. Now, in Jewish tradition, and in, in, in the way it should have been, 
James should have been standing there and he should have given that responsibility to James being the next in line. He would have been the, the next older brother giving that um, responsibility of care for the mother to the older brother. You find that happening in, in a lot of families and especially in our, amongst our, our African brethren. You know, the older sibling, especially if he's working, becomes the father um, to this, the younger siblings. And, and James was conspicuous by his absence from the crucifixion. So what happened? You know, maybe, maybe worst case scenario, John feeling that, you know, um, Jesus was getting his just desserts and, and what he deserved. And so something happened, um, you know, with between Jesus and John and maybe the other brothers, because all of them, were conspicuous by the absence, absence at the crucifixion. You know, it's only later we begin to learn a few things that um, uh, a week after Jesus' death, something changed in the heart of John. It's very interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. Now, I've got to come back to the reinstatement of Peter. Peter was actively serving Jesus and following him. He was um, Jesus was Peter's savior, was his Messiah, but he wasn't that to John and possibly to his um, other siblings. But, but you know, James is absent from the crucifixion. You know, his mother Mary is there. So something happened. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. Paul gives us a little bit of a, an overview of the resurrection of Jesus, building up to that great passage of the resurrection and the resurrection body in 1 Corinthians 15. And he tells us that he first of all appeared to Peter to reinstate him, and then to more than 500 brethren. And then it says, and then to James and the other apostles. So James is kind of considered possibly then amongst the apostles by that time, but he certainly wasn't then. So those that have put together the chronology or attempted a chronology of the appearance of Jesus over this time, put in the fact that somewhere in the, in the week, you know, after his resurrection, um, possibly on the way back from Galilee, he went to James's house. It seems that he went to James's house and visited James there and went to go and see James. And, and that, that appearance was so significant that it overcame James's initial skepticism. It overcame James's upfront out denial of Jesus. And something happened in that appearance. It wasn't a reinstatement. It was an instatement of James. And James becomes James the Apostle, the Apostle James. And he becomes a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? The reconciliation between two brothers post the resurrection. How awesome is this? What a caring heart our Savior has. What a family heart our brother has. And, and he came to do that for us as well. He came to bring us back to himself, our elder brother, our firstborn from the dead. So now we are all part of the church of the firstborn. And as the elder brother in Jewish tradition, he would share all of his inheritance out because then he would take the place of the father. He would share his inheritance out with the other brothers. But he did the same for us. Yee! Hallelujah. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, Paul tells us you know, that uh, we have been blessed with every, I'm getting so blessed now, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So he included not only his physical brothers, but he included us as well, other physical brothers. You know, we weren't blood brothers, you know, naturally speaking, but now we're blood brothers because of his precious blood that was shed for us. Oh, this is so awesome. I, I'm blessing myself. I trust that you being blessed. And, and James then dedicates himself um, to Jesus, dedicates himself to the church, dedicates himself to, to his brother. But the incredible thing is that he never referred to himself as the brother of Jesus, not in, in scriptural record, um, but in, in tradition and historians say that often when he preached, he would refer to Jesus and re refer to the words of Jesus, much to the delight of people. Man, I would have loved to have heard some of those sermons. 
James became very well known and inter- uh, influential in the church of Jerusalem. You know, as the number of disciples and, and especially the Gentile disciples began to grow, there came a great conflict between the Jewish and, and the Gentile believers. And then, of course, the leaders, those that were seen as leaders, and amongst them were Peter, James, and John. They were seen as the apostles and the leaders of the Jewish Christians, the Jewish believers. And you know, Paul Barnabas, and especially Paul, uh, Peter for a while when he went to Cornelius' house, but they were very much for the Gentiles. And, and so this there came this whole thing of where the Jewish believers wanted to influence the, the Gentile believers to become a little bit more Jewish. You know, that's kind of what is happening today. You know, we don't have to become Jewish and get into all Jewishness and get Jewish names and, and uh, you know, we celebrate all the feasts and festivals and things like this. Yeah, there's a big move about being Jewish. No, I'm Gentile. You know, I, I believe in Jesus. I don't have to call him Yeshua. Jesus is fantastic for me, you know. So there's a strong move. Bless you if you want to do that. But there's a strong move, you know, all things Jewish. And, and it's right there in the early days. And, of course, Paul strongly resisted that, even though he was a Jew. I mean, you see his pedigree in Philippians chapter 3. And um, But James became this leading figure. And now there's this conflict, you know, make them a little bit more Jewish. And, and so the, the first council, the first council, and it was under the leadership of James, possibly, or Peter and James and John, but it was James's council that said, no, no, we cannot put any of the laws um, uh, that we are under on, or were under on to the Gentile believers. Just three things, um, meat sacrifice to idols, blood of strangled animals, and then, of course, sexual immorality, avoid those things. And everybody concurred that those were enough, enough of a law, enough of a rule for the Gentile Christians. And then later, Paul was instructed by uh, James, you know, just remember the poor. And he says, the very thing I was keen to do. That was Paul's response. But Paul strongly resisted, although there was a time also when James encouraged them to go to the temple for the time of purification. And it seems like some of the brothers were taking Nazaritic vows. I think it happened twice, Nazaritic vows. And and so, and, and the one time there was a, a thing about circumcision that Paul conceded to. So what Paul was doing was trying to show that he was not averse to, to, to the Jewish customs, as long as it wasn't to the law that you were going for your justification. <coughs> Excuse me. Got a bit of a tickle in my throat. Um, I'm talking too much. Let me just have a sip of tea. Cheers. Bless you. <coughs> That's better. And so Paul's issue was, you know, and, and, and James would have concurred. You're not going to justification of your faith by the law. They all stood on that. But James was very pastoral and very concerning, just as equally Paul was to say, let's not try and make the Gentiles Jewish. Um, uh, um, James is seen as a defender of Jewish culture, but not at the sacrifice of the sacrifice of Jesus. And he was saying, you can't kick over everything and, um, and replace everything. We are Jews and we have a Jewish culture. And so the G- Gentiles were allowed to maintain their culture without contradicting the cross of Jesus either. And so some of that comes up in Romans chapter 14. I'm going on too long. But James became a leading figure in the church. And when Paul got his revelation, James was there and heard, and all together the disciples extended him the right hand of fellowship. Now, you know that um, James grew phenomenally. James became known as James the Just or James the Righteous. Eusebius, and I think Josephus, but Eusebius was one of the early historians, and they wrote about um, um, James. But he became influential. And evidently, he was one of the only ones, one of the few, or one of the only ones who was allowed into the temple on his own to pray. They say he had an incredible prayer life. It said about James that he prayed so much on his knees that people joked that he had camel knees because his knees were so calloused. His constant daily prayer, immense amount of prayer, um, led him to being called James the Just or James the Righteous. And um, the the the... Yeah, the popular opinion that there was no one more righteous than him. Now, this is James. This is James who was not at the crucifixion of Jesus. This was James who 
was a little bit cynical, John chapter 7, with his other brothers about Jesus, not recognizing him as the Son of God. But it was that post-resurrection appearance that changed his heart. And now he becomes a leading figure, um, influential man, influencing many people, preaching powerful messages. They say that he was extremely bold, extremely outspoken, powerful preacher. And um, this riled the, the, the Pharisees because very much after the, the fashion of Jesus, he was against that Pharisaism, that strict legalistic type of religion. Now, remember I said that he, just, he defended Jewishness, but not at the expense of the centrality of the cross. Man, he wasn't at the crucifixion, but when his brother Jesus appeared to him, he got the story of the resurrection and the importance of the cross and the sacrifice. And so he would speak about Jesus and it um, riled the Pharisees so much so that there came up a plot to kill him. And I've got to wind down the a plot to kill him. And it was under Annas, the high priest. And um, the amazing thing is that they took him to, um, in, they say around about AD 62, they took him to the pinnacle of the temple. Now, it's interesting, one of the gospel records, that's exactly where the devil took Jesus and said, throw yourself down. And, uh, you know, the angels will take charge of you and you, 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 know, you won't come to any harm. Your foot will not be dashed against a stone. And because of his exceeding bold and reckless disposition, um, you know, when they asked him to renounce Jesus, they demanded that he should renounce his faith in Christ before all the people. Because evidently there was a massive crowd waiting below and he was up on the pinnacle of the temple. And... Um, he said, and his response was this stated in one historical record. Why do you ask me about Jesus, the son of man? He sits in heaven at the right hand of the majesty or the great power. And he will soon be coming back in the clouds of heaven. Now, those are Jesus' very own words recorded in Mark 13, verse 26. However, because he wouldn't, they pushed him off. Some of the outraged Pharisees, some of them that taken him up, pushed him off. And the rest of the Pharisees were waiting below with a crowd of people and he hit the ground. And they say it was a great distance and he should have died. But miraculously, James the just, James the righteous, did not die. But when he hit the ground, he immediately got up and he got onto his knees and began to pray. I entreat thee, Lord God, our Father, forgive them, for no, they know not what they do. Amazing, amazing thing is the exact words of Jesus on the cross. And they say that there was one um, a man there, a, a, I think the Pharisee, who had like a club with which they used to uh, wash the, he was a launderer, a fuller, and used to wash the clothes with and beat the, the clothes to wash them. And he took this club and he basically beat Jesus to death while the others, uh, James to death while the others were stoning him. And uh, he offered up his spirit and, and he died. What a, an incredible lesson we, we learn from James the Just, the brother of Jesus. He was this man, um, you know, maybe grew up with a little bit of resentment around Jesus. Maybe Jesus is the older brother, maybe because of the prophecies. Maybe he was the blue-eyed boy. Maybe was, there was this family dynamic going on. And uh, Jesus takes time, like he did with Peter, takes time to go and visit him. Where he visited Peter, we don't know. Maybe in his home. But maybe in his home, he went to go and visit James, walked in. Maybe he showed him his hands and his feet again, as like he did with Thomas. But here, um, after Peter's reinstatement, James is instated. And James becomes James the Just, a leading figure in the church in Jerusalem, a leading figure, an apostle to the Jews, while Paul becomes an apostle to the Gentiles. And I just wanted to bring these... Um, this to you. It, it touched me. It blessed me so much. We're in a time now, that 40 day, we remember it, that 40 day period, you know, of the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of um, uh, whatever it is, you know. So we're remembering the time leading up to Pentecost, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, these appearances of Jesus. You know, Paul had multiple appearances. He was one untimely born, born in undue season, out of season. But Jesus appeared to him. And I'm not advocating weirdness. But what I want to do is just to encourage you. We're in a period of shutdown and lockdown. But, but biblically, and as far as the historical record, we're also at a time where we shut in. Maybe not out of fear. Well, definitely not out of fear. Out of obedience to the government and the requirements. But 
But what a time to encounter Jesus. And he's not unwilling. And maybe you're hopeless. Maybe your business is under threat. Uh, maybe you're not sure when lockdown does finally end. Do you have a job to go back to? You need, you need an appearance of Jesus. You need a visit from the Lord Jesus. You know, Psalm 8, what is man that you're mindful of in the son of man that thou visit him? And, uh, you know, Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. Jesus is concerned about what you're going through. We can see it from all of his appearances to all of these people, in particular um, to Cleopas and, and his friend who were both down, in particular to Peter who just denied Jesus, in particular to James who never believed in him from the word go. And maybe shadows of doubt, maybe concern, maybe worry is cryptic, maybe a little bit of fear and sleeplessness. Maybe you're looking at your bank balance and thinking, oh my gosh, how are we going to make it to the end of the month? And what if the lockdown continues? I want to tell you, you're a candidate for a visit from Jesus himself. You know, um, over my life, I'd, I've had some visitations with Jesus, some encounters, not weird, wannabe, visionary type of things, but encounters with Jesus where I was so desperately hungry for him. And maybe you become hungry for him. And, I, you know, and, and Jesus wants to be encountered. Um, he wants you to encounter him. He wants to encounter you as your loving high priest, as your savior, as your brother. He wants to encounter you. And I remember one time when Jared Cooper was ministering here, I had another encounter with Jesus. I remember sitting there. I was so desperately hungry. I was sitting on the front row, hands in my, my head in my hands. And I was just, Jared was preaching and it was such a powerful meeting. And I was just saying, oh, Jesus. I'm overdue an encounter with you. I'm longing for an encounter. And in a previous experience I had with Jesus, that his presence, that presence, that undeniable presence of Jesus, that absolute pure love where there's an absence of evil, an absence of fear, where there's an absence of darkness, where it's so overwhelming, where even physically, you know, like David says, my flesh longs off you. I could feel Jesus. And with, I was, my eyes were closed, but my head was facing the floor. And when I opened my eyes, there were the feet of Jesus, like I'd seen in 1994 in Toronto in the revival. Oh, and I was so overwhelmed with Jesus. And I was aware that he had his hands on me. I was aware of his spirit pouring over me. And I had such an encounter with Jesus that day. With Jared and his parents, we went out to lunch afterwards. I was overwhelmed. I couldn't eat. I just sat at the end of the table. I was speechless. I felt like Ezekiel with a strong hand of the Lord upon me. Maybe, just maybe, you need a fresh touch from Jesus. Maybe you just need an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, for him just to touch your life and to bless you and to minister to you again. And uh, during this time of lockdown, what an ample opportunity. What a, what a powerful time God has provided for us um, where you can be um, just um, encountering the Lord. Maybe, maybe you could, maybe you could just have a real time with Jesus. And maybe you could invite him to come and visit you in this period of post-resurrection appearances so passover is past but jesus is still present and he's with you he's emmanuel johan are you ready are you ready to go i'm going to just check with johan and he can just lead us out in some praise and worship i don't know who he's singing to but he's having a great time there and uh so let's just see he's very quiet over there johan are you ready i think he's still leading some praise and worship over there but uh, what I want to do is just encourage you as we're coming to a close. So um, I think Johan will join us now in a moment for another song and just to close the session. But um, I want to just announce something here and I hope you all listen. Tuesday morning, Tuesday morning, I want to invite you at 9 a.m. And uh, I'm going to um, just spend some time with Prophet Andre Bronkhorst. And the two of us are going to just chat a little bit about, you know, what do we feel that God is saying during this time? And, uh, you know, we don't need prophets for that, but yeah, they are there for that. I mean, we have his word. And, and I'm just so excited. Reno and I and others have been fellowshipping around the word and, you know, going backwards and forwards and, you know, making the most of this time. And, and well done, Reno. And I know many of you are as well, getting into prayer and the word in between doing the things that you need to do as well around the house. And, and some of you are working. And so, so bless you. So Tuesday morning, 
9 a.m. Now, tomorrow I'm going to be on a radio program with an apostle, a great apostle from Nigeria. We're going to be doing a radio show, a radio talk show. And then from the 27th of April through to the 2nd of May, somewhere in there, um, Jared Cooper is hosting um, something also on Zoom platform, The Prophets Speak. Um, and um, he's invited me to be a part of a prophetic group that we're just speaking and sensing what God is saying to the church locally or to the church globally, you know, uh, in this particular time. And, and so I'll be a part of that. So that'll be April the 27th to May the 2nd, somewhere around there, that whole entire week. But I'll give you more details about that. But Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. with Jared Cooper. Now, just before we go, um, because the time is up now, it's five past nine. And it seems like uh, Johanna's still busy over there. So I'm going to just let him go. And, um, but I want to just pray blessing over you and just encourage you. Maybe you're just uh, you know, tired of lockdown. Maybe, like I said, you're concerned about you know, the status of your job or the status of your, um, your partner's job or you know, your business. I had a message this morning from Vaynant Esterhazen in, uh, in, uh, in New Zealand. And I, I just shared a prophetic word and voice, voice note on WhatsApp about you know, about Ezekiel's value of dry bones. And somebody posted me a song, which I shared, which was about the value of dry, dry bones, about prophesying of your business. And he messaged me and said, please, can I share this with my brother? By the end of the lockdown, he's not sure if he's going to have a business left. So I want to just speak blessing over you. I want to speak no fear, perfect love casts out all fear. I want to just declare the words of Jesus where he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not the peace of this world, but my peace, the very peace of God. God, your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And why not reach out to God? Why not call out to him and, and experience a visitation? You know, you, it might be through the word. It might be, um, you might not see him. You know, it's very seldom do you see Jesus and have visions of Jesus. I've had visitations of Jesus where I've not seen anything, but where he's come over me, where I, he, I've sensed his presence, where I've sensed his anointing, his spirit fall on me. And I've known it's been an interaction with him, a visitation with him. And something transpires on the inside. And so I want to bless you with that. Seek the Lord. Call out to him. And um, let the Lord touch you in this time. So I'm going to just one more time go back to him. But I think he's ministering with Herod Krobler. So I'm going to release him. But bless you until next time. God be with you. Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. Love you all. And thank you for your faithful giving and your faithful support. And again, once again, I want to encourage you, if you're part of ACF or if you don't attend a church after this broadcast, you can go on to the website, get our bank account details if you would like to um, uh, make an offering towards Airport Christian Fellowship and uh, keeping the ministry going. Bless you all. I call a harvest on all of your seed in Jesus' name. Love you all. Bless you. Bye. Oh, Johanna's there. Yes, I'm here. Can you close out one song, Johan? I will. Just one song. Bless the people. I just finished with this song and uh, uh, doing this. I really just feel to prophesy this over South Africa and prophesy this over everyone watching. And let the song just encourage you and lift up your spirit and, and see what God is about to do in your life. Amen. So be glad, the children of Zion, rejoice in the Lord, your God, for he sends his rain to demonstrate his faithfulness. Oh, be glad, the children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord, your God, for he sends his rain to demonstrate his faithfulness. Oh, and once more, the winds will come, just like the rain of spring. Your threshing floors will be again piled up with grain. And your presses will overflow with new wine and with olive oil. Yeah, he's going to give you back what you
Wow, that was awesome, Johan. Thank you. What a prophecy. God is a God of restoration. And uh, he says that he will even restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Praise God for that. And he'll restore the days that the locusts have eaten. Johan, thank you so much. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Bless you. What an awesome song. Thank you for that. Um, you need to do something with that, that we can keep playing that somehow, that everybody can be listening to it and and you need to listen to the message, uh, you know, about hope during this time. Yeah, so awesome. Johan, we'll chat soon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Bless you, guys. Bless you. Love you. Bless you, ACF, and all those watching, wherever you're watching. We love you. Now, don't forget on um, Tuesday morning, Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., I will be with Prophet Andre Bronkhorst, um, 9 a.m. Maybe Johan can join us on Tuesday morning for a song or so at 9 a.m., uh, just see what his program is. And then we're just going to speak together. You know, two men of God just speaking about what we think that God is saying. But otherwise, I love you. Bless you. Thank you, ACF. Thank you for your continued prayers, your continued giving. We'll see you on the other side of this. Woohoo! Can't wait for our first service back at the church. Love you all.